with uh, some topics of the, your theory and uh, your political position. Um, if you want, I, I can uh, mm, explain. Let's that. just go. And, and mm. The first question is, if you, um, which is your hypnotism for, for uh, which the, is the conception of, of hypnotism is hypnotism? Hypnotism, yeah. And also the connection of this with the uh, rationalism. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't, I don't see innateism as an issue. I mean, everybody accepts some form of innateism. I mean, it, everyone agrees that humans aren't birds, let's say, when they're not rocks. And as soon as you agree with that, then you've accepted innateism, unless you're, you know, you believe in angels or something. Uh, we have some special innate structure that makes us humans. That's not even a doubt. There is, you, you could conceivably argue that we don't have any innate structure for language, but that's almost unimaginable. I mean, it's impossible to, with the most extensive effort, to teach even the, the tiniest rudiments of language to even higher apes, their closest relatives. And humans learn it without any evidence at all, virtually, just minimal stimulation. So it must follow that they have an extremely rich structure for language. Now again, somebody might believe, and it's been argued, that it's just our general intelligence applied to this uh, material. But in order to make that a serious proposal, you'd have to say, okay, what are the mechanisms of general intelligence? And how are they different from those of, say, apes? And nobody could even begin to answer that question. So to question that we have a specific uh, capacity for language, which in fact is highly restricted, to, to question to that, that is just mysticism at this point. Now, if people want to question it, okay, but it's like saying, I don't believe that uh, the law of gravity works. Uh, or if somebody said that I, I don't believe that innate structure makes, uh, makes some cells become chickens and other ones become humans, you can't argue with them exactly. It's just these are things that are obvious. The only interesting question is what's the innate structure? Uh, well, there are, you know, there are substantive issues, and lot, lots of work and so on. And my own feeling is it's so restricted that virtually all of language is innate and about the only differences between languages are in parts of the lexicon, you know, choice of words, uh, some grammatical elements and so on, very peripheral things. That can't really be established yet, but I think there's reasonable evidence for it. Um, as to the connection with rationalism, uh, there, there's a serious question of interpretation. I mean, uh, there is a tradition going from Plato into, say, Cartesian rationalism. And there are continuities, but there are also differences. Uh, one of the continuities has to do with innateism. Uh, Plato was concerned with very much the same problem. How, how, how can it be that we know so much when we have so little evidence? And, uh, for example, in the Mino, uh, the Socratic dialogue is essentially a way of teasing out from the slave boy his innate knowledge of geometry. That's kind of like a thought experiment, trying to demonstrate that the slave boy who had never heard of geometry actually knew it all. And, you know, the experiment is more or less accurate. I mean, that's what would happen under those conditions. Uh, Plato then wanted an answer, and his answer was that uh, it's in our souls and we remember it from an earlier existence. Well, okay, that's, that's not entirely false. It's in our genes, actually, and it comes from previous existence, in a sense. Uh, that answer and this problem then goes right into the 17th century. And, for example, Leibniz uh, argues that Plato's theory is much, must be correct. There's no other way to account for knowledge. But, as he put it, his theory has to be purged of the error of reminiscence. So, you know, somehow that was wrong, but he didn't have anything else to make right. Uh, in Cartesian rationalism is I mean, they're pretty much the same. I mean, it's basically in a, you know, the, the Cartesian rationalists tried to, uh, uh, for example, the ones who worked on language, say the people in the universal grammar tradition that in part grew out of this, uh, tried their concept of universal grammar is basically that which is in our souls, that which is there and doesn't change and so on. And they developed, you know, not by our standards, but by the standards of the time, fairly rich theories of universal grammar. Well, this tradition then continues uh, through German Romanticism and through the Enlightenment 
and it takes various forms. Uh, and then it sort of dies out in the middle of the 19th century uh, and really wasn't picked up again until the middle of the 20th century with some scattered exceptions. Well, that's rationalism. Well, what about, uh, in, in, under that interpretation of rationalism, this is a renewal of rationalism. However, there are other interpretations of rationalism. And you, can, you, know, you can decide what you want to look for in this tradition. It had a lot of things in it. One of the things that was in it was an attempt to uh, deduce all the facts of, of the world from first principles. I mean, Cartesian rationalism is, well, you know, you start with the cogito and then you keep going and you end up with all the facts about the world. Well, obviously this isn't rationalism in that sense. So it's a question, which, out of this rich, complex tradition, which strands do you pick out? Some strands that you can pick out carry from Plato right through classical rationalism into the Enlightenment and then on to the modern period. Other ones have been abandoned, which were quite central to them. If you look in contrast at the alternative major, uh, tr say the empiricist tradition, at least the classical empiricist tradition, say Hume, also was innatist. I mean, they didn't question that there was an awful lot of innate structure. Uh, just they thought it was a different innate structure. So Hume actually specified what he thought it was. It was principles of association and similarity and an innate concept of induction. I mean, remember, after all, Hume is, everybody knows, you know, he, he's remembered for the, his paradoxes of induction, but of course he also gave an answer. His answer was that it's just animal instinct, which is what we would call innate. So in Humean psychology, which uh, comes modern psychology in many ways, the principles of association by similarity and contiguity and so on, and the principle of simple induction are the innate structure. Well, that's just hopelessly inadequate. In fact, if you look at the contrast between Descartes and Hume, who were maybe the two leading figures in these two, I mean, you know, a century apart, but two leading figures in this tradition, actually looked at some of the same examples and drew opposite conclusions and crucial examples. So, for example, uh, uh, Descartes asks the question, rather like Plato, he says, suppose you presented a um, get the figure, try some geometrical figure, say a triangle, to a, ch a child in infancy before the infant had had any experience. He says the child would perceive it as a, as a triangle, which of course it isn't physically. It's always going to have a curve and a line and you know, always some distortion of a triangle. But the child will perceive it as a distorted triangle, not as a, an exact uh, uh, an image of what it is. I mean, it's some strange, indescribable figure. If I draw something on the blackboard, it'll never be a triangle. But he says the, the child will perceive it as a triangle, not which, which it isn't, it just resembles one. And he will not perceive it as what it is, because that's too complex. Uh, Hume looked at the same example and concluded uh, that he t mentioned, for him it was a straight line, but it's the same question. And he simply concluded, reasonably from his point of view, that people have no concept of a straight line. And the reason is because you can't tell the difference between a line with a slight curve in it and a straight line. So therefore, by his principles, it follows that you can't have a concept of a straight line. Right, there's a direct difference in predictions. For Descartes, you have a, you have a concept of geometrical figures, because that's the way your brain is, your mind for him is designed. Uh, uh, therefore, a person will see things in the world as modifications of geometrical figures. Hume, on the other hand, given his principles of innate structure, has to conclude and is honest enough to conclude that uh, you just don't have a concept of a straight line. Well, we know who was right about that. In fact, even without the experiments, it was obvious at the time that Humean psychology was refuted by this fact, uh, whereas Cartesian psychology was, if not proven, at least vindicated by it. Unfortunately, history took the, op the other turn. It was assumed that Hume was right and Descartes was wrong. Well, it's obviously the opposite. And it really wasn't until the modern period that this, uh, that it's become obvious to any perceptual psychologist, at least, that, uh, of course, Descartes is right. I mean, not that anybody thinks about Descartes anymore, but uh, if you, uh, the, the conclusion that is standard today is that, yes, obviously, the brain, no longer the mind, the brain uh, is designed so as to identify certain kinds of figures and not others, and in fact they're simple ones like lines and angles and so on.
And that's how we construct our picture of the world, uh, that basically the Cartesian con <coughs> conception without, without Cartesian uh, physiology and metaphysics. And nobody would take seriously Hume's proposal that we don't have a concept of a straight line. Of course we have a concept of a straight line, everybody does. Well, uh, in this, if, through this strain of the history, uh, the modern work is rationalist. But as I say, there are other ways of looking at the history. You can think other things in it are important. I mean, you can think the proof of the existence of God is important. Okay, in that case, this obviously isn't rationalist. Um, let's see, there was a, what did you say yes, for me? Uh, uh, I think the, the, the question is very well responded. Is the connection between, between the uh, innatism and the, uh, the conception of uh, the rationalism? Yeah, okay. But also in the sense of the rationalism, in, in, in the Cartesian sense of the discourse of the method, uh, mm, assume uh, um, from the from the beginning that uh, the common sense, the ration, is uh, in general uh, equally distributed. Equally distributed, all yeah. The well, that is a point of view. Uh, certainly in this domain, it's true. I mean, you have to go to really exotic levels of pathology before you find deficiencies in the language faculty. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, for example, if you take something as se uh, se severe as uh, the uh, down, I don't know, <laughs> down syndrome, mongoloid, mm -hmm. is, that, is that a, yeah, yes. okay, which is <coughs> pretty severe disability, genetic disability, and uh, the, uh, the uh, achievements of the chi child well, get vary, but they're not very great. But the language ability apparently develops normally, except sl more slowly. It's kind of slowed down, so they never get to the same point. Uh, and in fact, there are cases of uh, uh, children, people with uh, actually uh, uh, intelligence so low that it's unmeasurable, they can't do anything, but who have perfect language capacity. Uh, so uh, th th there doesn't seem to be a significant I mean, there are certainly differences in people's ability to learn second languages and that sort of thing, but these are minor phenomena. Uh, for initial language learning, the thing that everybody does naturally, the differences are you know, no more significant than the differences in how fast you grow. I mean, children differ, differ a little in where their growth spurts are, but they basically grow the same way. And that's true here, and that's essentially what Descartes is saying. Of course, he's saying it much more broadly be saying it for thinking generally, and that seems to me pretty plausible, but you know, when, you, when you move away from areas that are well understood, you can only speculate. Like, it's not true that everybody's, you know, equally competent to become a quantum physicist, but that's at the outer fringes of human intelligence. I mean, most of the problems to which human intelligence is adapted don't, as far as anybody knows, don't differ, the capacities don't differ in any significant way uh, across a very broad spectrum. So that picture seems reasonable at least, as a pretty good first approximation. In fact, Descartes himself pointed out that it's only a first approximation. He says you can find people who are incapable of doing things. You know. the, the second question is the um, relation between uh, uh, um, your uh, you are contrary to a uh, com uh, computational system, um, and uh, with uh, negation, negation uh, uh, also from the conception of the man as an automata, that uh, begins uh, also in the 17th century. Yeah, that's it's uh, the, the debate in the 17th century has been started up again in the 20th century without any. Re you know, any memory of it. Uh, the 17th century was, and in fact, for, in part for the same reasons. I mean, in the 17th century, the automata, you know, like complicated clocks and things, were getting to such a degree of complexity uh, that they, people began to wonder, are humans more complex automata? And in, in part, Descartes' thinking was motivated by that kind of question. And he wanted to argue for both for, probably maybe partly for religious reasons, but uh, certainly partly on scientific grounds that it wasn't true. And his, if you look at Descartes' actual philosophy, not what studied these, what studied today is usually some peripheral part of his philosophy, but for him what was important was uh, the physics and the physiology and, you know, the theory of vision and all this sort of thing. 
and the other stuff that we study is kind of around the periphery where you argue with other philosophers about it. Uh, but uh, uh, he argued that, in fact, most of the world was an automaton, uh, as the notion was understood and went on all the way through the animal world, they're all automata. Yeah, I mean, in, in many interpretations, um, assume that uh, Descartes affirmed that the, the animals were automata. They not, it's not, not a question. I mean, it became a scandal at the court because the, uh, you know, the, the Cartesians would go around you know, taking some court lady's favorite uh, dog and, you know, stepping on it because it, you can't hurt it. I mean, Descartes proved that it's just an automaton. I mean, that was one of the court scandals in the, in the period. Uh, so, yeah, they, that's, was, they thought this was demonstrated. Animals are automata. And then there comes a big debate for hundreds of years about whether animals are automata. But, uh, uh, Descartes argued that mo almost everything about humans is automata as well, all the way up to sensation. I mean, through uh, certainly human physiology, but uh, up to the point where you get to sensation. And in fact, it wasn't until it, you get to higher mental processes like language uh, that he thought he could prove that it wasn't automata. And what it ultimately comes down to is various manifestations of freedom of will, which he said are inconsistent with the notion of an automaton. It's kind of uncaused behavior, but not random behavior language was his major example. And the descriptive comments are correct. I mean, it's uh, at least as far as we know. Uh, so he then invokes mind, the second substance race, cogitants, to account for this. All of this is you know, sort of normal science. I mean, it's sketchy science, like he didn't really fill anything in, but it's an outline of scientific reasoning, uh, large parts of which remain quite viable, in fact. Uh, so then the conclusion is, well, man's not an automaton because of these, pro these phenomena such as ability to choose what you do. You know. And I quoted in Girona some of these famous statements of the minor Cartesians who developed all of this. I mean, their position was that machines are compelled to act in a certain way, but humans are only incited or inclined to act in a certain way, and they may act contrary to their inclinations, maybe choose to do so. Like you can choose to put your hand in the fire, let's say, though you're not going to do it. Uh, whereas an automaton can't. If it's designed in a certain way, it has to do what it's structured to do. Uh, well, then, you know, comes Newton, who showed that the world is not an automaton, which you know, really shocked people, including Newton. And after that, you get a big debate. I mean, the sort of reasonable response to that is, uh, uh, the idea that mental phenomena, including language capacity, are just some properties of complex organized matter, just as attraction and repulsion are. And none of it fits into Cartesian automatism. I mean, Newton's major discovery in many ways, the one that disturbed him most, uh, was the proof that uh, Cartesian physics won't work for terrestrial or planetary motion. Uh, that the world and the planets and so on are not an automaton, as the uh, as the notion was understood then, or for that matter now. You know. uh, it's uh, it required mystical properties, you know, occult properties, as he called them, such as universal gravitation. I mean, uh, Newton, you know, in his letters he writes that anybody who has any understanding of philosophical matters realizes that I can't, that you can't influence something without contacting it. Like I can't raise my hand and you know make that cup of coffee move. I have to contact it. Is that's obvious? Any person with with a brain understands that. It just happens to be false. Uh, he proved that it was false, and he was very disturbed by it naturally. Well, at this point, the man, you know, the automaton, the mind-machine problem disappears. The, the world isn't a machine, so obviously the mind isn't a machine because even the rest of the world isn't. Uh, since you have properties like action at a distance. And as you go on through the sciences, you just have more and more exotic properties. I mean, magnetic fields and uh, you know, quantum effects and curved space-time and so on and so forth. Uh, that, that was a big crisis of the period. I mean, how are you going to react to Newton's demonstration that what was called the mechanical philosophy, you know, the common sense understanding of how things work in mechanical ways, was just not true? Uh, uh, and in fact, physicists didn't really give it up until into this century. There were always attempts to find some mechanical explanation of gravity, I mean, ether or something or other. Uh, 
um, as to the uh, the mind, this this con conception that was enunciated by uh, by people like uh, Lemaitre, for example, that the mind is just uh, the structure of organized matter. It's the right idea, but it also lapsed. I mean, it sort of disappeared until it was picked up again in the 20th century. Well, in the mid 20th century, people were again excited by automata. Now it's computers, uh, and uh, the same debate started over again. On, in different terms, of course. Uh, but in fact, the Cartesian conclusions are not unreasonable. I mean, if, even if you take contemporary uh, computers instead of uh, complex clocks and so on, it seems to me the arguments still hold. There's, there's no way in which complex computers can manifest properties such as uh, the ability to choose, let's say. The, the distinction between, I mean, computers are just as much compelled as old-fashioned clocks were, uh, and uh, humans aren't, apparently. They're only incited and inclined. So that gap remains. I mean, nobody wants to look at it, but the gap remains, I think, at least. Uh, uh, I, I don't think that computer, the, uh, uh, ad, the coming of computers hasn't really changed the terms of this problem very much. Uh, and in fact, the kinds of things that people try to get computers to do are the mechanical aspects of human behavior, you know, like uh, compute and say, you know, play chess, let's say. Well, play, playing chess can be reduced to a mechanism. And when a computer plays chess, it doesn't do it the way a human does. It doesn't work out strategies and make choices and so on. It simply runs through a mechanical procedure of uh, trying out tentative moves. It uses its vast memory and speed to explore in depth what would happen if you made this move, that move, and the other move, and then it evaluates the outcome by some measure that the programmer threw in and then it automatically selects a move that's nothing like what a human does, even in a, what is intellectually speaking, you know, trivial pursuit like ch chess. Trivial, not any do it easily, but it's a very trivial game. You can describe it in ten sentences, you know. Uh, so the problem remains where it was. That's, uh, I think it's a much bigger problem than others think it is. You know, and I think that the Cartesian, although the basis for the Cartesian argument collapsed because the mechanical philosophy collapsed, uh, the, the central logic still applies uh, and uh, modern computers don't change things much. Uh, the debate that has now come along is usually uh, pursued in quite different terms. Uh, um, so uh, the debate is over things like whether a computer could really would really be understanding a language if it duplicated human performance in response to language. Well, you know, that, that's a, I don't even think that's an interesting question uh, because, of course, a computer wouldn't understand language any more than an airplane can fly like an eagle. Uh, understanding language and the rest of the uh, intentional discourse about thinking and feeling and so on, this is, these are terms applied to humans. Nothing else can do. Human brain can't understand language. It doesn't make sense to say the brain understands language any more than it makes sense to say the wings of an eagle fly. You know, flying is something the animal does because that's what the word means. Uh, but on the other hand, the, the, the topic that's debated, say, by you know, Searle and the rest of them, is, actually has to do with what could turn out to be mechanical procedure. Uh, it would be quite consistent with Cartesian belief if there was an algorithm that went from hearing a sentence to giving an appropriate response that may not involve free choice. Uh, so that asp so they're really studying a, what could turn out to be an automatism without even touching the Cartesian argument. Notice that nobody talks about uh, the problem of uh, the speaker who produces new uh, utterances fitting to the occasion. Nobody tries to duplicate that because it would be totally hopeless. It's not even a conceivable task. What they study is the problem of giving an appropriate response to a certain input, that's an input-output problem, which in theory could be, could be automatic. Whereas the problem of action, which has no input, you don't even know how to formulate. That was exactly Descartes' point. So in many ways, I don't even think the discussion about machines and automata is even reaching to the levels of sophistication of the 17th century debate. If I may, if I just make a comparison. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.
water. Thanks. Working okay? All right, yes. Yeah. It's working. Can't okay. tell you how many interviews I've had where after three hours the interviewer <laughs> just forgot, realized he hadn't pushed the button. <coughs> Happened to me once on the BBC. <laughs> I think that this question is disconnected with an, uh, a concept that you use in a sense very different of the common sense of the, the, the nation. I, I remember a, a, a discussion with uh, Foucault, uh, between Foucault and you, that uh, one of the topics was, was this, the use of the mode, uh, the, 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 the word creativity. Mm. I think you use creativity in a sense very different from the art of mm. Well, I, but that, I made that very clear. I mean, there's no real issue there. I, what I said is the, the, these aspects of choice of appropriate action, I said is creativity in a certain sense. Of course, it's not creativity with aesthetic value. That's a different sense of creativity. So these are just terminological points. Actually, the, the, the first person who discussed this in any depth, as far as I know, was a Spanish philosopher in the 16th century, pre, pre-Cartesian. Uh, Juan Huarte. Huarte, yeah. yeah. I don't know how much people study him, but he had very interesting things to say about um, set the levels of uh, intelligent action. And he had three levels, and the second level of his is what I'm talking about. Then he said there's the third level, which is true creativity. Uh, and in Platonic tradition, he said that's when you have a, an element of madness. The, that's the artist, you know. But uh, the, the, there's also, in the Hartian system, there's a level of creative action, which is just normal human behavior. And that's beyond animals. You know? And this is the, what the Cartesians are talking about, not aesthetic creativity. Actually, this, all of these ideas enter into aesthetic theory. I mean, if you look into uh, uh, the, the aesthetic theory of the Romantic period, where they're very much influenced by Cartesian philosophy, and people like Schlegel and Coleridge and so on, uh, the similar ideas are quite, you know, consciously, they know the source, are consciously developed and, tr and adapted to poetic creation or, you know, musical creation and so on. And how successfully one could argue, but uh, anyway, there's an attempt to develop them. And um, the general conception of the world is that, that the world is one, and the form of to approach them is uh, also one, uh, the sciences, well, natural sciences, in most of that. Is it, is it correct? No, it's not clear what it means. I mean, the, in the natural sciences, one sort of works by a kind of a hope that things will become unified, but they never have been. I mean, up to the present day, there are aspects even of physical theory that are not unified. I mean, take gravity, you know, still not unified with weak forces. People hope that there'll be a unified theory of nature. Uh, but, uh, of course, when they talk about nature, they're talking about a very special part of it. Um, there's, no, there's no rational reason to believe that things like human thought and action belong to the kind of nature that physicists are talking about. That's the Cartesian problem again. So sure, everyone you know, kind of hopes somehow that there'll be a more unified way of explaining things. The reason for that hope is just that you hope for deeper understanding. And if uh, the, wor the universe turns out to be divided into separate realms, you won't have understanding of why those realms differ or what their relation is. So naturally, one hopes that there are no limits to understanding, or, you know, actually some people might hope there are limits to understanding, and I can see reasons for that too, but uh, within science, you kind of act on the uh, working hypothesis that you can always understand more. And to say that you can always understand more is to say that you expect uh, a kind of unity of nature. Because every time you link things up, like you link biology and chemistry, you understand a little more. You understand things about biology that you couldn't understand before. Uh, but whether there are limits to this process, whether the world is in fact designed so that this, there is a unified account of everything, it's an open question. And the fact, the idea that humans might be capable of finding it, even if it's there, is not at all obvious. Uh -huh. In this sense, um, which, are, are there any connections between uh, your um, um, political um, beliefs, beliefs and uh, your conception of 
mind and uh, languages? Well, you know, there are various kinds of possible connection. Uh, as to logical connection, of course not. I mean, one could have any political beliefs and any beliefs about language, and it would be perfectly consistent. As for uh, sort of accidental historical connection, like my own personal case, there's no connection. I mean, my uh, political attitudes and beliefs were formed long before I ever heard linguistics, uh, when I was a young teenager, in fact and, you know, changed since, but not gross greatly. Uh, um, as for uh, conceptual connection, it could be, I mean, there might be. In fact, if you go back uh, to, uh, say, the Enlightenment, oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah. if you go back to the Enlightenment period, there, was, there were attempts to draw the connections between these views. So in the case of Wilhelm von Humboldt, who was both a leading linguist and philosopher and uh, uh, a founder of the modern classical liberal tradition, a libertarian thinker, and that he did try to find connections. Um, he argued that uh, at the heart of his political conceptions is the desire to, the need and the, uh, the human need to inquire and create free of external authority that leads to libertarian thought. Uh, and he, at the heart of his linguistic conceptions was the, basically the Cartesian idea that there's something about humans that uh, makes them, you know, part of their nature is to be creative in this second level sense, that is, do new things, even for him even in a higher sense of uh, aesthetic creativity. Uh, so his argument was, well, they come from the same source, whatever it is that makes us, uh, that makes us capable of uh, indeterminate human action, appropriate indeterminate human action, also gives us the moral right to be free of any external authority. That's the connection. And it's not an unreasonable connection. Uh, I don't think that people have tried to, Rousseau has the same picture at about the same time, a similar picture, you know. And after, I haven't been able to find, there's, there's something like that in Kant, you know. Uh, of course, Kant wasn't interested in language, so it doesn't show up there. But uh, and after that, I can't find any further traces of it. But it seems to me, a, which may just be my lack of knowledge of parts of the tradition, probably is. But uh, in uh, it, it doesn't come back again until the modern period. And and then I, and now I think you can raise the same speculations. Uh, it's not a proof of anything, but it's a it's a conceptual similarity, which may imply an actual link or may not. I think in, in your conception of the law of the resistance uh, for, um, against the law or the, the misunderstanding of the law, um, you need to uh, an access to, to consciousness, to moral consciousness, mm -hmm. which is the, the, the normal access to. Because I think there is a connection between the the media of, of information to, to, to the normal man, mm -hmm. which is uh, manipulated by the press, by the uh, education. So what's the connection between your moral consciousness and your obedience to the law? How is the way? To How do we get moral consciousness? To, to the moral consciousness? consciousness? Nope, nobody has any idea. I mean, somehow we get it through a combination of experience and intuition and, uh, you know, thinking about the problems of others and so on. In fact, there's a there's a definite broadening of moral consciousness over the ages. The things that were considered entirely legitimate, you know, 200 years ago are considered Nazi-like today. For example, if some third world country today were to produce something like the U.S. Constitution, which was a, you know, a revolutionary document at the time, highly libertarian, if, say, uh, you know, some third world country today were to produce it, we'd call it a reversion to Nazism. I mean, after all, you take a look at the U.S. Constitution, and there's a category of people who are described as three-fifths human. You know, it's like if you're a slave owner, you get an extra three-fifths of a vote for every slave you have. Well, you know, I mean, that's beyond discussion today, but it was quite in keeping with the, uh, uh, the uh, attitudes of the time. In fact, not only slavery, but genocide was considered perfectly legitimate. I mean, where I live in Massachusetts was you know, no Indians around because the Puritans just carried out genocide. And they considered that not only moral, but they thought it was they were following the word of God. 
and basically they were right. I mean, they appealed to the Old Testament, which is probably the most genocidal book in the whole literary canon, uh, and uh, said, look, we're doing what the Hebrews did to Amalek. You know, when we wipe out the uh, uh, Pequots down to the last child, you know, and, and disperse them to make sure that they don't reproduce and so on. And so that, that was considered highly moral. You know, genocide was considered highly moral, not just tolerable. Uh, and uh, it would be, you'd have to go pretty far to the, the limits to find somebody saying that today. Although, you know, not, maybe not all that far, but uh, pretty far. Uh, the, uh, and, and the same comes right up to the present. I mean, uh, uh, questions about women's rights, for example, were not taken anywhere near as seriously 30 years ago as they are today. That's an expansion of moral consciousness. Uh, questions about animal rights were unimaginable 20 years ago, but they're taken fairly seriously today. So, for example, there are now even laws for uh, treatment of laboratory animals, which were unheard of 20 years ago. Uh, and there are many people who think that you shouldn't even allow that. I mean, vegetarianism is an expansion of the moral consciousness. Uh, you know, what are the right expansions? One can debate. But that the moral sphere has been expanded is undoubted, undoubtable, and that's indubitable. And that means that we must, the only reasonable interpretation of that is that over time with new, this is over historical period, so it's not our personal experience, but over historical experience and accumulated historical experience and uh, 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 you know, so lots of struggle and conflict, the mor the, our, we get a kind of access to our moral consciousness that one didn't have in an earlier period. Uh, and there's no reason to think that that process, it's, it's, a, it's not a process of linear marching forward by any means. So if you go back a uh, hundred years ago, uh, somebody like, say, Andrew Carnegie, the founder of the, you know, the world's first billion dollar corporation, at least publicly stated that he believed that things like wage labor were in, inhuman. That's, he said he regarded socialism as the, uh, such an obviously true ideal that if we ever reach it, we'll have achieved the millennium. Uh, well, you know, his counterpart wouldn't say that today. The idea that wage slavery is, uh, and, and it was quite common among working people. Uh, many people who fought in the Civil War, you know, sort of ordinary working people, that, that thought that they were fighting to eliminate slavery, then became industrial workers in the growing industrial system of the post-Civil War period. It's quite common at that time to, to say, look, we fought to eliminate slavery. We're just being made slaves again by be becoming tools of production in the new industrial system in which we have to follow the orders of the masters. That's what we fought against in the Civil War. Well, that's, I, I think, I mean, here, you know, maybe difference of interpretation, but m in my opinion, that was a level of insight into our moral nature that's been largely lost. Uh, the idea that renting yourself to others in order to survive is an infringement on your nature is something that was commonly understood a century ago and is barely in the sphere of uh, uh, cultured awareness today. Uh, um, please wait. Uh, hearing your process and uh, your um, political interventions, I have the impression that you are absolutely optimist about the future of the sciences, and you are very pessimistic about the evolution of the, so the, the social life. Uh, well, you know, whether people feel optimistic or not is a matter of their personality. It's it doesn't mean much. Uh, you do the same things whether you're optimistic or pessimistic. I mean, whether you think that things are going to work. Or, or it, it, I've always regarded it as kind of a Pascal's wager. If you don't try to change things, you, you can be sure they're going to get worse. If you do try to change things, maybe there's some chance they'll get better, maybe a small chance. So given those alternatives, there's no question what you do. And how optimistic or pessimistic you are is uh, just something you see. I mean, very often I've been very, I happen to be rather pessimistic, and often I've been wrong. Uh, so, for example, let's say uh, in the, in the Indochina, the Vietnam War, when I got started really seriously uh, active and trying to do something, I was absolutely certain that there could never be an anti-war movement. I mean, it, this was in the early, well, 1963, 1964. Uh, there were, you know, the U.S. had already been bombing South Vietnam for a year or two. Uh, 
Uh, there were American troops there. there were, by then, there were probably about 150,000 people had been slaughtered in Vietnam. Nobody cared. You know? Nobody cared that the American Air Force was going out on bombing missions every day, just bomb blasting villages. Uh, and people wouldn't talk about it. You, know, they, you couldn't get them interested. You couldn't get anybody to sign a petition. I mean, it's, uh, it was un few people did get started trying to do something. It was with a sense of total hopelessness. And in fact, it was quite a few years before a substantial anti-war movement developed. In, in places like Boston, for example, which is you know, one of the more, maybe the most liberal city in the United States, certainly one of them, uh, we couldn't even have uh, public demonstrations against the war until well into 1966, because they'd simply be broken up by violence, with the support of the press and radio and so on. Uh, and it certainly didn't seem at that time that there was ever going to be an anti-war movement, but in fact, you know, I was totally wrong. There not only was an anti-war movement, but a, you know, kind of a cultural revolution, which has lasting impact. Or to take a contemporary case, well, take, let me mention a case that just happened. Uh, I, I've been working, I guess, for, I don't know, 15 years or so now on the, on the issue of uh, the Indonesian invasion of East Timor, which is, you know, the worst act of genocide since the Holocaust, and very significant for us because the United States uh, gave the primary diplomatic and about 90 percent of the military support for it, right through the Carter period. While Carter was spouting off about human rights, he was increasing the flow of arms to Indonesia uh, while they were slaughtering Timorese. Uh, and Europe, the only reason Europe could, didn't do more of it is because they couldn't break the U.S. monopoly. I mean, as soon as they were able to, they try, every, every country in Europe that I know of is selling arms to Indonesia and contributing to the slaughter of the, of the Timorese because they can make money on it. Well, you know, you can't imagine a less popular topic than this. Nobody even heard of it. Press refused to report it. You know, refused to report it. Not didn't, but refused to. Uh, in fact, it's not because they didn't know about it. They knew, but they didn't want it to be known. Uh, and so trying to get people interested in this topic, you know, 10,000 miles away, I mean, no American troops, was, did really seem hopeless. Uh, and there were actually only about half a dozen people working on it, a few of them full time. I mean, there's several, there's one person in particular who just dropped out of graduate school. He was a Southeast Asian specialist and has spent his entire life since the mid-70s working on this topic, uh, working with churches and people in Congress and, also, and, you know, and so on. Others like me have been writing and speaking. Well, you know, it finally got to the point that to my, I mean, I, I never imagined there'd be any hope for this. But to my amazement, just a couple of months ago, uh, there was the U.S. Congress canceled aid to Indonesia on these grounds, military aid. Well, it's a symbolic act because, you know, Britain and Holland, everybody else will be happy to rush in and provide the military aid. But it's an important symbolic act. Uh, for the Indonesians, it's a warning. You know, they may not get away with this forever. And if something similar could happen in, say, France or uh, Holland or, you know, any of the other big military suppliers, it would make a big difference. Uh, you know, here's a case where maybe half a dozen people at most ultimately succeeded in uh, doing something which, you know, could save the, could save hundreds of thousands of lives, not to speak of allowing people freedom. You know. So you never know. You do what you can. <laughs> uh, I'll ask a question because I, I've been in the time. Uh, it's a personal question. What, what did you study language and not? history or I didn't. Or Actually, I didn't. As any of the linguists around here will tell you, I have no professional qualifications in the field. Uh, first of all, I don't know any languages. I mean, I have the least linguistic capacity of any human being I ever saw, which is why I can't speak a word of Spanish. You know. uh, also, I never really studied linguistics. I mean, the reason, there's a reason I'm teaching at MIT, uh, which is a science and engineering university. When I got my PhD, I didn't have any qualifications in linguistics. No, no university with a, you know, decent self-respect would have hired me in linguistics. Uh, and in fact, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't really have any intention of staying in the academic world. I went at, at MIT because, you know, they, it's a scientific university. They're willing to play around with strange ideas and head of, the head of the electronics lab happened to be intrigued. Uh, so I went to an electronics lab where I still am, actually. I mean, I don't know a tape recorder from a telephone, you know. But I'm, I've been in an electronics lab for almost 40 years now because, and in fact, 
linguistics developed out of that. But my own background was extremely exotic. It was a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and mostly self-taught, you know. So it's, it's not a model for anything. I mean, up to today, you know, my students, like when he was a student, he knew 10 times as much about linguistics as I did, and my students always do. I mean, they know literature I never heard of and all sorts of things. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was very glad you could come. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just a no, photo. No, no, no. Only on. Yes, sure. uh, yes, all right. I got it off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, myself. But I want them to know, really, what you think, and I want this to be published, I think. So that's why I've, I've asked for the trivial one. Yeah, sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hold it so it okay, doesn't great. fall. Yeah. Okay, the first question it would be what led you to devote your life or parts of your life to linguistics? Uh, mostly accident, like most things that happen in life. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I had, I'd more or less dropped out of college by the time I was about 17. It was just terribly boring. I didn't want to go on. Uh, and I was interested mostly in politics. And I happened through political connections to meet someone who was uh, actually a rather important. Uh, sort of left libertarian thinker. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he happened to be the professor of linguistics at the University of Pennsylvania where I was nominally a student. And I sort of, I got friendly with him and uh, you know, through one thing led to another, I started taking his courses. And I just sort of got interested in it and went on. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, well, accident basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, then. The second question would be, what are the distinctive features of the Chomskyan way of doing linguistics, or what would you like non-linguists to know about linguistics as you understand it? You well, you know, you study what you can hope to understand. There are things you might like to understand that you can't really study. So one of the most obvious fact about language, the fact that it's immediately obvious to us if we look at it, is that, uh, and as people have noticed through the ages, is that somehow people can continually say new things that they've never heard before, or maybe that have never been said before. Uh, they do it effortless, effortlessly. They do it in ways that are appropriate in the situations where they are. Other people hear them, understand them immediately, uh, and human interaction continues that way. So there are a lot of questions that can be asked about that. Uh, one question you can ask about it is, what are the mechanisms that make it possible? And a further question you can ask is, how do we achieve this, uh, uh, how do we gain those mechanisms? How do they develop in our minds? And with regard to the mechanisms, there's two choices. I mean, one is sort of the technical mechanisms, what are today called the computational mechanisms. And the other is the question of uh, how we use these computational mechanisms to speak appropriately and in novel ways and so on and so forth. Only some of those questions have been subject to uh, serious inquiry. The question of what the computational mechanisms is, is, is a lot understood about that. And it's uh, given a tremendous amount of insight into uh, some of the aspects. It's one of the few areas of higher human mental function where there's some real understanding of how the thing works. As to the second question, uh, how do these mechanisms develop, which is a much more interesting one still, uh, there, there are also pretty good answers by now, and they seem to be demonstrating more and more that it isn't learned. It's just there. It's part of human nature. Uh, as to the third question of how we put these mechanisms to use in human interchange, how we do what you and I are doing now, let's say, there's essentially nothing known, and we don't even know how to study it. Mm -hmm. So the uh, uh, 
rough, roughly speaking, I think this del delimits the... Uh, there are other questions that one could ask, for example. How are these mechanisms realized in the brain? That's a problem that could maybe will come to be understood someday. Right now it's not. There are questions about how this, these capacities developed in species. Nothing's known about that and maybe nothing ever will. It's not even clear how to study it. Mm -hmm. Could I try to sure. figure out just in case? That's a problem. No. compare in your work linguistics to physics or to chemistry. I would ask you, how is linguistics related to science? Uh, well, th these aspects of linguistics are just part of science. And uh, by comparing them to chemistry and physics, I don't mean to suggest that they, either that they've achieved that level of sophistication or that there are direct connections. Just that it's a methodological point we should study these questions the way we study the rest of the natural world. And physics, chemistry, and biology show how you should study the natural world. And in my opinion, one should study these questions the same way. Uh, whether all of the study of, there are many parts of the study of language that don't fall under the sciences in any sense at all. I mean, they're part of cultural anthropology or some other field. Uh, as to these questions that are always lurking on the horizon and that we can't seem to approach, like the questions of language use, it's not clear whether they can be studied by the methods of science, which is after all human science, it's a special human capacity, uh, maybe some other uh, intelligence organized in a different way from ours could study these problems. Mm -hmm. I had an, another question related to this. Uh, as you do relate linguistics to science, are you trying to make it... Well, the relation is really just inclusion. It's part of science. Okay. But then why don't scientific journals include articles on linguistics? Journals that include... What would you say? Is it because... Well, it depends what's, what do you mean by scientific journals. Um, I mean... Yeah. Yeah, if... Uh, if, if, if you mean, say, nature, the reason is that the kind of, uh, there's all, you know, there are lots and lots of kinds of work that are never included in those journals. They, they usually run short articles reporting experimental results and so on and so forth. And that's not the nature of this field. Uh, there are many scientific fields that don't publish in those journals because it's not the nature of the field. Also, th there are other reasons. I mean, it's more or less, you know, the, the chances that the contemporary results in physics or biology will uh, impinge on the work of linguists is very small. And conversely, I mean, if there's some new discovery in linguistics, there's nothing much that the chemist can do with it. Uh, so it doesn't make much sense to use the same organs for publication, though one might. Mm -hmm. okay. Another question is, uh, non-genitive linguists and non-linguists very often criticize genitive and transformational grammar because it changes so rapidly. Now, could you explain the reasons for these changes? And do you think non-genitivists are aware of the reasons and the changes? Well, this is an indication of the sharp break between the sciences and the humanities. All the sciences change rapidly. I mean, every time you read a new issue of physical review, physical, you read the letters column, it has, you know, indications of changes that are happening. Any field that's alive is changing. Uh, this field is a young field, so it's just barely beginning to find its way around. If it stopped changing, it would, I, sh I would advise everybody to drop out of the field. Any field that stops changing is dead, probably wasn't worth studying in the first place. Now, in the humanities, this is not understood. Uh, they, it's regarded as important to keep saying the same thing all your life that you said when you were in graduate school. But in the sciences, that's a joke. I mean, if you're teaching the same thing you taught when you were in graduate school, you, you're wasting your time, you're in the wrong field. So, and the reason why things change is you learn more. You know, 
you learn new things. I mean, new phenomena come along that weren't noticed before. People have new ideas as to how to improve the theory. They, they think up reasons why the theories that had been proposed didn't work, so you've got to modify them. That's scientific inquiry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could you give us an example of how this, these the changes, changes take place? within linguistic theory, within theory? Well, I mean, the early work in generative grammar, uh, I mean, it tried, I mean, it had two different goals which were in conflict. One goal was to try to describe the facts of each language accurately. And in order to do that, you had to, apparently had to write extremely complex systems of rules because the phenomena of language seem very intricate and varied and, you know, every language looks different from every other one and every part of each language looks different from other parts and so on. Uh, this wasn't really understood in traditional grammar, but that's because it never got to the stage of writing rules. They didn't, not, a, not in, a sen in the sense in which that's now understood. They only gave hints that could be used by a person who already knew language to make his own moves. Uh, but when you tried to spell out what it is that people actually know, it turned into extraordinarily intricate rule systems. Well, the second question, the, the, uh, uh, the question of trying to explain how people get this into their, how they acquire this knowledge, that uh, that the answer to that question must be that most of it is already there because it's impossible to have enough experience to even pick up a tiny fraction of these rules. Uh, so it can't be that the languages are as complex and differ different as they appear to be. And the effort to, to answer the question of uh, acquisition of language, of the growth of language in the mind, had to lead you to the belief that there's basically, there's very few options available. Uh, there are very few possibilities for language. And the child must settle on those choices with very little evidence, because we know that that's all that ha there is. Uh, that's leading in another direction, to try to claim that things are very simple. Now, that t resolving that tension over the years has led to lots and lots of changes, uh, to the point where today we're beginning to understand how fixed principles that don't change at all can yield a wide variety of the phenomena of language just by interacting in slightly different ways. So it's as if you have a very complex system and you change little pieces of it here and there, you may get, an, it may do something quite different. You may change the way the wires are hooked up in a few places. Uh, the system may behave quite differently, radically differently. And the task is to try to find that initial wiring uh, that, and the points at which the changes can be made, and then to demonstrate that the apparent complexity and variety of language is just an illusion uh, due to our, the uh, inability, our, the previous failure to understand the simplicity of the underlying structure and the ways in which the few changes can be made. And there's been a lot of progress on that. Every single one of those progresses is a change in steps, is a change in theory, sometimes a radical change. Another question is that people usually, it is a popular belief that the existence of language is essentially for communication. Uh, I would ask you if you agree with that. And well, it's hard to agree. I don't agree or disagree. I don't know what it means. Biological systems aren't for anything. They're just there. I mean, if a child grows, an embry the embry uh, before birth, a child grows arms and legs. It's not doing it because it wants to walk. Uh, in fact, even if we look at the evolutionary process, it's extremely hard to say what functions things were for. So the, the wing of an insect, let's say, developed as a device for uh, distributing heat from the insect's body. It turned out you could distribute heat better if you had a little thing sticking out and it turned into a wing. Uh, I mean, humans certainly use language, as language to communicate. They use it for a million other purposes. They use it to tell jokes. They use it to establish friendly relations with people when they don't care about communication. They, they use it just to express their thoughts, you know. Uh, there are all kinds of reasons for using language, and who knows what, what doesn't make any sense to ask what the purpose is. Uh, biological systems don't come along with a purpose, you know, they just grow for, develop for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you, you just think you, the aim of your theory is to study knowledge of language, right, not use. No, I would like to be able to study use. It just oh, doesn't so. seem to be within the realm of study. Okay, so you don't think it can be studied in the same <coughs> Well, if it, nobody, nobody knows how. Uh -huh. I mean, there are a lot of interesting things you can say about language use, but 
the, you know, there are a lot of interesting things you can say about history uh, or, you know, social structure or something. Lots of interesting things, but nothing in, in the level, there's no theoretical understanding. Uh, in fact, in general, most of the questions of real human significance are out of the range of scientific understanding, at least for now, maybe forever. You know. mm -hmm. And this, this use of knowledge that uh, yeah. you, you emphasize very often. Well, I just, leaves. well, you know, um, one doesn't have to use it. If they don't want it, it doesn't matter. But uh, the point is we have acquired a certain capa cognitive capacity, a certain mental capacity. Mm -hmm. That's what people call knowledge. You know, we know a lot. I, I think a good deal of what is called knowledge is just the change of parts of the brain to particular states in which information is stored. So, you know, knowledge of how to get from here to Girona is probably stored somewhere in your brain. Uh, knowledge of uh, what sentences mean is stored somewhere in your brain. Everyone agrees that, you know, children or adults know that so and so, and so means such and such. And I want to know how that knowledge is stored. Well, it seems to be stored in a generative grammar. Uh, and then we want to find out what that is. So to emphasize knowledge of language is just to say I'm interested in the topic. Uh, I and mean, if one is not interested in why this sentence means such and such and the next one means so and so, sure, then study something else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, does generative grammar then have anything to do with applied linguistics? Or is it useful for any applied purposes? It, well, that's for people who you make the applications to decide. I mean, it's, you know, for, for th and throughout most of modern history, the sciences haven't been useful for anything. It wasn't really until the 19th century that it became important for an engineer to know something about physics, because physics just didn't tell them very much. They knew the craftsmen, craftsmen knew more about how to do things than the scientists did. And it's really only about a, you know, last 150 years maybe that uh, you could find ways of using even the advanced sciences for applications. Uh, in <coughs> fields like, uh, and, and there's no, you know, the, the theoreticians have nothing to say about this topic. Uh, you know, uh, if, if people who are applying, who are studying, say, real world topics like problems of national language, let's say, or of second language teaching and so on, if such people find these ideas of value and use, then use them. Actually, they, they usually do, but that's a matter of trial and error. There's nothing, there's nothing principled about it. I mean, the problems of applied anything are usually so complex and involve so many factors uh, that you don't know how much theoretical understanding would contribute even if you had it in any such sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question I guess related to context of Catalan also would be, what, how does the notion of dialect fit into your theory? Or is it relevant to distinguish between mm. dialects and languages? And it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with this theory. I mean, the decision about dialects and languages is it a decision. It's like a, it's as if you had a group of people in a room and you tried to decide which ones look alike. You could do that in a lot of different, I mean, you know, there, there might be, a, you might agree that they, uh, in lining them up so that this one looks most like this one and that one looks most like this one and you get to the end and it's the one that least, looks least like that one. But if you started to try to draw a boundary among the lookalikes, uh, you could do it in a lot of different ways. Dialects are languages that look more or less alike. Languages are groupings of individual languages that look less alike than dialects, but more alike than what we call different languages. I mean, you could take the whole Romance area, say, you know, Spanish, Catalan, Portuguese, on, and in a sense they're all the same language, with just mm -hmm. little differences. Uh, in fact, what's called Chinese is a bunch of languages which aren't even mutually comprehensible. They just have some structural properties in common. Uh, th these aren't very meaningful questions, actually. I mean, they're very meaningful for human life. I just, they're not scientifically meaningful. Like, who looks alike might be important for human life, too. It's just there's never going to be a science about it. It's mostly a matter of decision. Mm -hmm. And one final question. Uh, can the knowledge of two languages, as in bilingual children, mm. uh, which is something that we have we're very open here, who acquire two languages in parallel. Could in parallel, in yeah. In parallel. Uh, could that be explained with a model of knowledge of one language, 
could one approach the study of bilingualism? Well, if it can, first of all, I mean, it, again, that's a more, whether a person is, bi is multilingual or not is more a matter of decision than of fact. In fact, every child who grows up has many different languages stored in their head. I mean, because you, you hear people speak differently in the, your parents speak differently from your teacher and speak differently from the children in the streets and you go to the other side of town and they speak still differently. They're, those differences are usually so small that we don't call them differences, but they're there. And if you look closely, you find that if you travel one or two blocks away, you'll find people who talk differently from you do. Uh, I mean, my brother and I, for example, don't talk the same way because we had slightly different influences in our lives. And, but I have no problem with understanding him, which means I must have at least those two systems in my head, and in fact dozens or thousands, who knows how many. Uh, we call it multilingualism, when the systems that you have in your head are far enough apart so that we're struck by the differences, and we have to make some effort to move up and back between them. Uh, if there's, in many, you know, in, in, at least certainly in pre-modern societies, it was absolutely standard for people to know many such languages. You could say go to West Africa today and a child may grow up knowing you know, half a dozen different languages which are really mutually unintelligible because that's the way the societies are. They're just very mixed and so children pick up a whole bunch of different languages. Uh, in most modern societies, differences among people have been leveled either by force and conquest or by uh, you know, ex expansion of a national culture, I mean, by these days even by state television, you know, uh, so that you get an illusion that of uh, homogeneity of language, which wasn't true in an earlier period. I mean, even in Europe, you, you don't have to go back very far. I mean, when you go back to the beginning of the century, let's say, and people couldn't understand someone from the next village because they were talking some, and it's probably still true in places like, you know, Italy at least. I don't know if it is in Spain, but do you get that kind of linguistic diversity? Do you get that kind of linguistic diversity in Spain that you have in, say, in Italy of real mutual unintelligible? Yeah, no. Not, yes. not but in, large, but in say, France, let's say, you would, at the beginning of this century, you could find people in nearby villages who were speaking what are, for all practical purposes, different languages. Now, all of that stuff has been leveled, or largely leveled. You have to assert, at least in this generation, it's mostly leveled in Europe. Although still, you know, a person from North Germany and from South Germany may have a very hard time understanding each other. Uh, if there's ever going to be any understand uh, any uh, comprehension of how uh, multi you know the assimilation of many languages develops in the brain, it will doubtless be through some further application of the understanding of how a single language might. I mean, what we'll need to know is, in addition to the question how a single language develops, we'll have to know how. Uh, interactions are constructed between these single languages that develop. So that's just a f further complication of the problem of acquisition of a single language with other factors thrown in. Mm -hmm. okay. Can I ask yeah. some questions mm -hmm. I've been about um, um, teaching in elementary and high school? So that it's there are obvious uh, things to do like that ready to language like learn to speak, to write and to read and maybe foreign language. But uh, um, one would expect that uh, in the same way that uh, it's interesting that people know things about the world in the sense of uh, you know, some physics and biology, that uh, things about language should also be taught in that. Yeah. But they are, yeah, I mean, you know, after all, language is a very important fact about our lives and about our nature. And if it's important to understand something about how uh, birds behave or how rocks behave or how planets behave, it ought to be important to understand how humans behave. And this is one of the few areas where we have at least some insight into what are distinctively human capacities. There aren't many such cases. So, but that, that's a matter of studying about what's understood about language different from studying language itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another maybe definition that I would ask you or to make things clear for uh, some people, the definition of grammar, people think of grammar as, you know, prescri prescriptive grammar. Yeah. How does it fit in with Doesn't. what you... I mean, prescriptive say, grammar is you? just a form of authority. It's like etiquette. You know, you tell people that they should put their fork on the left or they should wear a tie when they give a talk or something like that.
I mean, it, it's basically nothing. You know, it's, it's a matter of how to. Uh, I mean, it has no theoretical interest. Again, it may have human interest. Like uh, maybe you want to try. Maybe you should even teach it. I mean, maybe it's worth teaching children some kind of usually artificial literary standard uh, for whatever reason, some practical reason. But uh, there's nothing of any theoretical interest to say about it any more than there is about styles of dress. I mean, you probably want to teach children styles of dress too. But, but the popular belief is that when someone knows a language, they know the norms of the language. Well, and that's what people tend to think. Yeah, because people, well, I mean, but they should understand, they should understand that every person has a perfect knowledge of their own language by definition. Now, you, whether you decide to follow norms that someone in authority tells you to follow are up to you to decide, but there's, there's no abstract right or wrong about it. It's a matter of whether you want to choose to defer to authority. Sometimes it's worth deferring to authority, like it makes more sense to drive on the right than on the left because you'll survive. That's deferring to authority. And sometimes it may be useful to follow some rule that some, somebody made up for some arbitrary reason that's followed in the formal, uh, in, in the you know, literary canon. Okay, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it's basically a question, it's the same kind of question. It's a question of whether to accept usually artificial norms that have been designed for whatever purpose. They have no status other than the status that people agree to give to them. Well, there's nothing right or wrong about driving on the right. Okay, it's just, you know, there's a law that says drive on the right, and life is better in that case if everybody follows the law, so you follow it. In other cases, like uh, norms of grammar, it's almost totally arbitrary. It's like whether you should wear a tie, you know. Uh, you can decide to do it because it's easier to get by in the world or whatever, but uh, there's nothing of any significance about it. Thank you. With uh, some topics of the, your theory and uh, your political position, mm -hmm. if you want, I, I can uh, mm -hmm. explain. Let's that. just go. And, and mm -hmm. The first question is, if you, and which is your innatism? For, for Which the, is the conception of, of innatism is innatism. Innatism, yeah. And also, the connection of this with the uh, rationalism. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't, I don't see innatism as an issue. I mean, everybody accepts some form of innatism. I mean, it, everyone agrees that humans aren't birds, let's say, and they're not rocks. And as soon as you agree with that, then you've accepted innatism, unless you're, you know, you believe in angels or something. Uh, we have some special innate structure that makes us humans. That's not even in doubt. There is, you, you could conceivably argue that we don't have any innate structure for language, but that's almost unimaginable. I mean, it's impossible to, with the most extensive effort, to teach even the, the tiniest rudiments of language to even higher apes, their closest relatives. And humans learn it without any evidence at all, virtually, just minimal stimulation. So it must follow that they have an extremely rich structure for language. Now again, somebody might believe, and it's been argued, that it's just our general intelligence applied to this uh, material. But in order to make that a serious proposal, you'd have to say, okay, what are the mechanisms of general intelligence? and how are they different from those of, say, apes? And nobody can even begin to answer that question. So to question that we have a specific uh, capacity for language, which in fact is highly restricted, to, to question to that, that is just mysticism at this point. Now, if people want to question it, okay, but it's like saying I don't believe that uh, the law of gravity works. Uh, or if somebody said that I, I don't believe that innate structure makes, uh, makes some cells become chickens and other ones become humans, you can't argue with them exactly. It's just these are things that are obvious. The only interesting question is what's the innate structure? Uh, well, there are, you know, there are substantive issues, and lot, lots of work and so on. And my own feeling is it's so restricted that virtually all of language is innate and about and crucial examples. So, for example, uh, uh, Descartes asks the question, rather like Plato, he says, suppose you presented a, uh, I forget the figure, tri some geometrical figure, say a triangle, to a, ch a child in infancy before the infant had had any experience. He says the child would perceive it as a 
as a triangle, which of course it isn't physically. It's always going to have a curve and a line and you know, always some distortion of a triangle. But the child will perceive it as a distorted triangle, not as a, an exact uh, uh, image of what it is. I mean, it's some strange, indescribable figure. If I draw something on the blackboard, it'll never be a triangle. But he says the, the child will perceive it as a triangle, not which, which it isn't, it just resembles one. And he will not perceive it as what it is, because that's too complex. Uh, Hume looked at the same example and concluded uh, that he t mentioned, it, for him it was a straight line, but it's the same question. And he simply concluded, reasonably from his point of view, that people have no concept of a straight line. And the reason is because you can't tell the difference between a line with a slight curve in it and a straight line. So therefore, by his principles, it follows that you can't have a concept of a straight line. All right, there's a direct difference in predictions. For Descartes, you have a, you have a concept of geometrical figures, because that's the way your brain is, your mind for him is designed. Uh, uh, therefore, a person will see things in the world as modifications of geometrical figures. Hume, on the other hand, given his principles of innate structure, has to conclude and is honest enough to conclude that uh, you just don't have a concept of a straight line. Well, we know who was right about that. In fact, even without the experiments, it was obvious at the time that Humean psychology was refuted by this fact, uh, whereas Cartesian psychology was, if not proven, at least vindicated by it. Unfortunately, history took the, op the other turn. It was assumed that Hume was right and Descartes was wrong. Well, it's obviously the opposite. And it really wasn't until the modern period that, this, uh, that it's become obvious to any perceptual psychologist, at least, that, uh, of course, Descartes is right. I mean, not that anybody thinks about Descartes anymore, but uh, if you, uh, the, the conclusion that is standard today is that, yes, obviously, the brain, no longer the mind, the brain, the only differences between languages are in parts of the lexicon you know, choice of words, uh, some grammatical elements and so on, very peripheral things. That can't really be established yet, but I think there's reasonable evidence for it. Um, as to the connection with rationalism, uh, there there's a serious question of interpretation. I mean, uh, there is a tradition going from Plato into, say, Cartesian rationalism. And there are continuities, but there are also differences. Uh, one of the continuities has to do with innatism. Uh, Plato was concerned with very much the same problem. How, how, how can it be that we know so much when we have so little evidence? And uh, for example, in the Mino, uh, the Socratic dialogue is essentially a way of teasing out from the slave boy his innate knowledge of geometry. That's kind of like a thought experiment, trying to demonstrate that the slave boy who had never heard of geometry actually knew it all. And, you know, the experiment is more or less accurate. I mean, that's what would happen under those conditions. Uh, Plato then wanted an answer, and his answer was that uh, it's in our souls and we remember it from an earlier existence. Well, okay, that's, that's not entirely false. It's in our genes, actually, and it comes from previous existence, in a sense. Uh, that answer and this problem then goes right into the 17th century. And, for example, Leibniz uh, argues that Plato's theory is much, must be correct. There's no other way to account for knowledge. But, as he put it, his theory has to be purged of the error of reminiscence. So, you know, somehow that was wrong, but he didn't have anything else to make right. Uh, it, Cartesian rationalism is pretty much the same. I mean, it's basically in a, you know, the, the Cartesian rationalists tried to, uh, uh, for example, the ones who worked on language, say the people in the universal grammar tradition that in part grew out of this, uh, tried their concept of universal grammar is basically that which is in our souls, that which is there and doesn't change and so on. And they develop, you know, not by our standards, but by the standards of the time, fairly rich theories of universal grammar. Well, this tradition then continues uh, through German Romanticism and through the Enlightenment, and it takes various forms, uh, and then it sort of dies out in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, and really wasn't picked up again until the middle of the 20th century, with some scattered exceptions. Well, that's rationalism. Uh, what about uh, 
in, in, under that interpretation of rationalism, this is a renewal of rationalism. However, there are other interpretations of rationalism. And you, can, you, know, you can decide what you want to look for in this tradition. It had a lot of things in it. One of the things that was in it was an attempt to uh, deduce all the facts of, of the world from first principles. I mean, Cartesian rationalism is, well, you know, you start with the cogito and then you keep going and you end up with all the facts about the world. Well, obviously this isn't rationalism in that sense. So it's a question, which, out of this rich, complex tradition, which strands do you pick out? Some strands that you can pick out carry from Plato right through classical rationalism into the Enlightenment and then on to the modern period. Other ones have been abandoned, which were quite central to them. If you look in contrast at the alternative major, uh, say the empiricist tradition, at least the classical empiricist tradition, say Hume, also was innatist. I mean, they didn't question that there was an awful lot of innate structure. Uh, just they thought it was a different innate structure. And so Hume actually specified what he thought it was. It was principles of association and similarity and an innate concept of induction. I mean, remember, after all, Hume is, everybody knows, you know, he, he's remembered for the, his paradoxes of induction, but of course he also gave an answer. His answer was that it's just animal instinct, which is what we would call innate. So in Humean psychology, which you know, comes modern psychology in many ways, the principles of association by similarity and contiguity and so on, and the principle of simple induction are the innate structure. Well, that's just hopelessly inadequate. In fact, if you look at the contrast between Descartes and Hume, who were maybe the two leading figures in these two, I mean, you know, century apart, but two leading figures in this tradition, actually looked at some of the same examples and drew opposite conclusions. Uh, is designed so as to identify certain kinds of figures and not others, and in fact, they're simple ones like lines and angles and so on. And that's how we construct our picture of the world. Uh, the, basically, the Cartesian con <coughs> conception without, without Cartesian uh, physiology and metaphysics. And nobody would take seriously Hume's proposal that we don't have a concept of a straight line. Of course, we have a concept of a straight line. Everybody does. Well, uh, in this, if, through this strain of the history, uh, the modern work is rationalist. But as I say, there are other ways of looking at the history. You can think other things in it are important. I mean, you can think the proof of the existence of God is important. Okay, in that case, this obviously isn't rationalist. Um, let's see, there was a, what did you say yes, for uh, this, uh, I think the, the question is very well responded. Is the connection between, between the uh, innatism and the, uh, the conception of uh, the rationalism? Yeah, okay. But also in the sense of the rationalism, in, in, in the Cartesian sense of the discourse of the method, uh, um, assume uh, um, from the from the beginning, that uh, the common sense the rational is uh, in general uh, equal distributed. Equally distributed. All yeah. the well, that is a point of view. Uh, certainly, in this domain, it's true. I mean, you have to go to really exotic levels of pathology before you find deficiencies in the language faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for example, if you take something as se se uh, se severe as uh, the uh, down, uh, <laughs> down syndrome, mongoloid, is that, is that a, yeah, okay, which is <coughs> pretty severe disability, genetic disability, and uh, the, uh, the uh, achievements of the chi child well, get vary, but they're not very great. But the language ability apparently develops normally, except sl more slowly, it's kind of slowed down, so they never get to the same part. Uh, and in fact, there are cases of uh, uh, children, people with, uh, Actually, it's an uh, intelligence so low that it's unmeasurable, they can't do anything, but who have perfect language capacity. Uh, so, uh, th th there doesn't seem to be a significant, di I mean, there are certainly differences in people's ability to learn second languages and that sort of thing, but these are minor phenomena uh, for initial language.